Hello, everyone. So, in public speaking, they always say there are three things that you should always, you know, aim at. So you should have brevity, levity, and repetition. So, let me say that again. So, brevity, levity. Thank you very much. And repetition. So, well, with that in mind, let me first kick this start, kick kick this off by saying, well, what is a catalyst? So. I'm sure we're all very intelligent and well-educated people here, and so we will automatically know that catalyst uh, has its roots from the archaic word catalysis, which is in turn from the Latinized Greek word kata and lean, referring to the process of breaking down something. Okay, so a catalyst is something that remains unchanged, but which can bring about change in others. Okay, so the question we should be asking when we are thinking about catalysts is. Well, how do we bring about change? How do we motivate this action? So, what I think we should take from this is that we are looking for the ability to invent, to find more meaning in things. Perhaps by breaking down things and so to see things in new ways. So, seeing things differently. Perhaps that's how we find catalyst. So, again, let me say that in a different way. Uh, you will know about the famous allegory of the cave, which Plato post posited as a thought experiment. Imagine there is a cave, and then in that cave there are a bunch of prisoners who were chained there from birth, and then to them, the whole life, all they see are shadows reflected on the wall. Okay, so to them, because they grew up not knowing anything else, to them that's the entire world. That's reality. That is life. And actually, if you force them to look at the fire, oh, you know that is the source of the reflections. They would find it too painful, too difficult. They would find confronting with reality too painful. They would reject it. So, what we need to do in the process of finding enlightenment and seeing the world differently, what we need is something to pull the prisoners out. We'll see on the right. So we pull them out, force them. To look at the real world, and then, if we do things right, the prisoner who is now out will now see things very differently from the way they did before. And in fact, this new way of seeing will be so different that if they were to go back to the cave and talk to the other prisoners, the other prisoners will think, "Oh my God, what's wrong with this person?" Right? You know, going on about th these things called fire and outside and light and so on. They would not. Understand what's going on. You will completely change the way you look at the world. Okay, so that is something to bear in mind. And you know, this is not a very terribly impressive idea. You know, once you get it, basically, you know, oh, okay, you learn more and then you see things differently. Tada! Right. But herein lies the problem. For those people who are imprisoned over there, it is actually very, very difficult to break them out. Of that that way of thinking. So,、uh, in cognitive psychology, this is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Meaning, if you are, you know, suffering from some sort of mistaken belief, that lack of awareness will prevent you from recognizing that you lack awareness, right? So, if you don't know what you don't know, then how can you learn about it? So, well, the objective. That I would like to convince you of today is that catalyst is all about recognizing that this objective world that we are in it doesn't change. Like you know, it's just what it is. This is the real life. But what needs to change is our way of looking at things. So catalyst is controlled by our way of seeing, the way of seeing things differently. That is what I believe catalyst is. So well, I mean, why am I the one to talk about this? So.、Um, I am one of the co-founders of a local theatre company called、uh, Shadow Players. So, we were a bunch of, you know, rather foolhardy people who started doing theatre in university and then realised that up, upon graduation, that oh my God, after graduation we'll have to stop doing this, and that's like unbearable, terrible. So we decided to just well start doing it ourselves. And then, what we would like to achieve is to make Western literature approachable. To a local audience, because we love literature and theatre so much, we would like to help people look at classical literature the way we do, 
to help people recognize that, oh, come on, this is so great. Why won't you like it? It's so obviously awesome, right? So, and as you do theater, you think differently because as, as an actor, as a producer, as an audience, you look at the script and you say, I mean, there's a simple enough statement, but who is saying it? It changes the meaning. I mean, what is the background that made someone say it that changes the meaning? I mean, why is he or she saying something that changes the meaning? Uh, for example, uh, in The Importance of Being Earnest, a very famous comedy by Oscar Wilde, uh, Algernon, the character, says, the only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her, if she's pretty, or to someone else, if she's plain. And then people look at this and say, oh my god, this terrible Oscar, wow, such a misogynist, oh, I hate this person. Oh. But actually, he put this in the mouth of a playboy, who is someone that we are not supposed to sympathize with. Right? So when we look at a script as an actor, as a, you know, an interesting, uh, enlightened, allow me to say, member of the audience, we look at the bias, we look at the context, and we look at the motives. Right? Another example that people always quote is in Shakespeare, they say, ah, neither a net lender or, nor a borrower be. But people say, ah, I don't borrow money, and Shakespeare said so. But who did he make say that? It was Polonius, an aging, you know, slightly mad person who we are not supposed to take seriously. So I believe that theater forces us to think about these things constantly. And so if you see someone who is, you know, not someone that we are supposed to admire say something, oh, then you recognize, you see the same um, statement very differently. So uh, let me develop upon this a little bit. So another thing that theater does is it presents the world in a different frame. And this process of reframing is very important because uh, as we look at things differently, which is what theater does, uh, we can gain very interesting insights. So um, there was this Israeli psychologist called George Tamarin who did this survey. So what he did was uh, he found 1,000 children aged 8 to 14, and he showed them two stories, basically the same story, except he changed some names around. Okay, so this is the first version. So uh, this is a story from the Bible and say, uh, Joshua found this um, advice and then they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, destroyed all the men and women, young and old and so on. And then he asked the students, well, do you approve of what Joshua did? And the students said 600 out of a thousand said total approval, it's fine, kill all of them, it is right. And then 200 others had mixed feelings, and then another 200 expressed disapproval. This is version two. So essentially the same thing, but he moved it to an ancient Chinese kingdom led by General Lin, no relation. So General Lin and his soldiers took the towns and utterly destroyed all that was therein, men and women, young, old, ox, sheep, and ass with the edge of the sword. Essentially the same thing. Well, what happened next? This time, 750 students expressed total disapproval, and then only 70 versus 600 totally approved of the action, and the, and the rest had mixed feelings about it. So we see that by changing the frame, by changing the context, we come to very different like, um, conclusions, okay? So, well, why is this important, right? So we live in an age of so-called post-truth, the word of the year last year, or AK8 as lying, right? So we live in this world where people uh, choose to sensationalize over sticking to facts and research. So there is a greater need than ever to look at things with sharper eyes, taking a broader view, but how do we teach and practice it, right? Because it's very difficult. You can't just thrust people into looking at world politics, right? It's too complicated. It's a recipe for disaster. People will shout at each other, okay? So what we do is to wrap it in entertainment, okay? Because by putting things in a different way, you help people to see things differently. So perhaps that is a chance of bringing about change. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, so the European Union has a center for global affairs, and then they've commissioned us to put on uh, a revival of our earlier play, The Learned Ladies, uh, based on Moliere's La Femme Savante. And so, this is a story about a fraud, 
someone, a not very good poet, who charms a bunch of rich, rich Thai Thais and then makes them believe, oh, like, he is amazing. And then, so that they would grant him the marriage of his daughter, okay, and that uh, he'll gain wealth and power with it. But then ultimately, of course, he gets found out and then he's banished, people know better. Uh, we first put this on uh, several years back during the race uh, for the chief executive, and then we chose to name the character C.Y. Tang. <laughs> so, and then, you see, and then it got people thinking, wait, you know, how, how dare you say that? I mean, is it a fair thing to say? Why did you say that? I mean, it, does everything fit? And then it inspired some discussion, and then it got people thinking about it from a very different direction, and it was lighthearted because, hey, it's just a play, right? And then so people could talk about things. So I'm not saying that theatre is unique in being able to force people to think about this and that, but I am saying that we know from experience that having stories and characters really inspire passion. It is a much more effective way of getting people to care about things than an essay. Right? Teachers will know if you start talking, you know, teaching anything at 9 a.m., students are sleepy. At 11, 12, they are hungry. After lunch, they are sleepy again. And then a few hours after, they are thinking about what's going on after school. So, but put them in front of a play, and then you get people engaged. So, in all, what am I talking about? So I am urging all of you to participate in the process of just go watch a show, buy some tickets, help us out. So, <laughs> because what is theater? Theater is, first of all, it is protection, okay? Uh, satire and illusions is a very important part of the freedom of expression. So for example, uh, in Animal Farm, I mean, what do you mean I'm talking about communists and Stalin and so on? It's just a pig, you realize. It's just some pigs on a farm doing this and that. So theater allows the creative expression while being protected. Uh, in publishing, this is called the small penis rule, in that if you want to write something about someone, you add in a little comment, oh, by the way, this guy has a small penis, so that the guy, no one is going to come forth and say, hey, 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 that guy you said bad things about, that's me with a small penis, and so on. So, well, satire, protection, uh, it's a very important part of the freedom of expression. And theater is also about critical practice, right? If you teach someone to swim, you are not going to throw them in the ocean immediately. People need practice. So when we are thinking about thinking, critical practice, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if there were materials, settings, like, you know, a script that is clearly, cleverly written down, and you know, comes with guides, discussion questions, and then it's acted out by pretty people, and it's filmed in high definition on a DVD. Hey, we have that. It's called theater, right? So theater offers us a kind of safe space, if you want to think of it that way, to allows us to, which allows us to really look at things differently and to discuss things um, in a safe space. So finally, I also think this is perhaps a little bit self-serving, but watching theater is also a kind of social duty. Why, why, why do I say that? Um, I believe that theater, if you do it right, it's all about questioning. Every time you watch a show and then you come up and you say, okay, did you like it? Why did you not like it? Why? And then that is in essence critical thinking. If you want democracy, we can't be satisfied with low quality discourse. Right? We need to get people used to always questioning, why did that happen? Who was saying it? What made him or her say it? But hey, why not do it through theater? Right? So theater is basically the practice and participation of thinking. And so perhaps it is the thing that would drag you out and then make you see things differently. So I want to wrap this up by using this very simple demonstration uh, that I sometimes use in class about the importance of context. So this is uh, a picture taken by the National Geographic about a polar bear pushing on an ice-breaking vessel. So, I mean, what is this bear doing? Is this a commentary on the sad fact of human-caused global warming? Is it a very playful bear trying to find people to you know, play with? Is it an evil bear trying to eat us? I mean, uh, what is happening? So. Each time you look at it, you think about the context, and then the entire story changes. 
So the act of filling in those blanks, the act of seeing things differently, I believe that's the essence of theater and education. And I believe, hey, if you, you know, think this sounds like a good idea, go out and buy a ticket, watch a show. So <laughs> thank you very much.